Here we are in Plano, Illinois at Farnsworth House, completed in 1951 by the great modernist architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Let's take a look at this beautiful house that was built as a weekend retreat for Dr. Edith Farnsworth, a friend of Mies who gave him full freedom to create whatever he envisioned. Which did become a problem later on, which we'll talk about. The first thing that we notice, or don't notice, as we approach the house are the glass walls of the house. The continuous glass walls make the interior completely transparent to the surrounding site. Creating walls entirely of glass changed the role of walls in a building. Yes, walls cease to become a structural element that um, separate or shelter the inside of the structure from the outside. Buildings with glass walls fully expose the interior and invite the exterior in. Um, in this house, the sense of boundary between the interior and exterior is removed. As we go indoor, um, we don't become detached from the outside. It's true. The indoors is just a shaded space. And yet the glass walls still retain that comforting feeling of enclosure and stability that we seek within the walls of our homes. Yes, um, what I like the most about this house is that it doesn't only complement the surrounding nature, it wears a nature as is stretched infinitely around it. The house is just two parallel planes suspended in the air, a single geometric structure held up by just eight steel columns, enclosed by glass walls, and the architecture just feels very pure and honest. And in harmony with its surroundings. The white steel beams contrast with the darker trunks of the surrounding trees, but the vertical lines of the beams match the rhythm of the vertical lines of the trees. The house is independent, but also in interdependent with its environment, which is a concept that intrigued modernist architects like the Bauhaus of the Bauhaus movement, like these. Modernist architects also asked if and how a building can express the relationship between the individual and society, and the tension and harmony that exists between them, and how a space can influence the life that takes place in it. This is exactly what Mies was experimenting with its design, and what the client had not expected. In fact, it was really difficult for her to accept the fact that her house was completely transparent. <laughs> it's not surprising that Mies' design raised a lot of questions about its practicality and livability. He was driven by his belief that functional architecture can also become art. In fact, in fact, he said, in its simplest form, architecture is rooted in entirely functional consideration but it can reach through all degrees of value to the house, highest sphere of spiritual existence into the realm of pure art. The idea of combining creativity with functionality to create art for everyday life was fundamental to the Bauhaus movement. Bauhaus artists and designers sought to create functionalism through simplified and geometric forms and beauty through contrasting properties of materials. The Bauhaus movement, which started in Germany literally meaning house of building, placed so much importance on architecture as a total form of art, and this is when what we think of as modern architecture now became um, what we think of with the steel frame construction, glass wall, geometric forms, and the absence of ornamentation, and also the harmony between function and design. When the Bauhaus school shut down in Germany during World War II, many Bauhauslers moved to America and brought with them ideas such as minimal dwelling and less is more. Farnsworth House certainly expresses these ideas, and there's nothing attached to the house that breaks up its simple and geometric form, and even the interior of the house lacks clutters and ornamentation. Its simplicity and transparency gives it a feeling as if the house is removed from physical reality. And we find in it a focus on purity and the spiritual essence of our environment, and also in ourselves. Also, the perfect balance between the geometric and the organic, without distractions. Maybe this was Mises' idea of pure art. Well, this is The Connoisseur, a cover image that Norman Rockwell painted for the Saturday Evening Post in 1962. It is currently in the private collection of the filmmaker Steven Spielberg. During the 47 years that Rockwell worked with The Post, he painted 322 cover images. This is number 317. Many of Rockwell's most familiar images were created as covers for the Saturday Evening Post, which was a weekly magazine with a circulation of 6 million in 1960. So the Post provided an enormous audience for Rockwell's images. It's true, and Rockwell's audience adored him. They saw his images as capturing what it meant to be American, an Americanness that middle-class Americans in the first half of the 20th century aspired to.
This image, the connoisseur, isn't a typical Rockwell composition in many ways. It features a realistic image of a formerly dressed older man, but we don't see his face. And he's alone in this picture. There aren't any children or dogs or other folksy or humorous <laughs> elements in the scene. This is a relatively Spartan composition for Rockwell. We see the gentleman from behind as he stands very close to a large square painting hanging on the wall of a gallery or museum. This appears to be a dialogue between the gentleman and the painting. The painting itself is familiar. It imitates the work of Jackson Pollock during the late 1940s, also known as his strip style. The connoisseur is all about the contrast between the photorealistic rendering of the figure and his setting and the ersatz Pollock painting with its splatters and drips of color. Pollock was one of the painters most closely associated with the abstract expression, expressionist movement that developed in the United States after the World War II. Abstract expressionism was the fine art movement created entirely in the United States, primarily in New York City. Artists working in the abstract expressionist movement produced primarily large-scale, non-representational works, but there was no single defining style to their movement. Rockwell's imitation drip painting is, isn't exactly a copy. No, Pollock didn't cover his canvases so densely. His paintings often had a sense of lightness or transparency. He also didn't create square canvases. Pollock's drip paintings were all over composition that he created by spreading canvas on, on the floor of his studio and applying house paint with unorthodox tools such as dried out paint brushes, sticks, and basting syringes. Pollock's working method couldn't be more different than Rockwell's, where Pollock emphasized physical gesture in the application of paint to a canvas without preliminary sketching, Rockwell meticulously planned his compositions with preparatory sketches and detailed photographs, which he then projected onto the canvas to be filled in with oil paint. He even sketched and practiced and posed for a photo with his fake Pollock. Even though the post reader would have probably been familiar with the style that Rockwell was imitating with the drip painting style in The Connoisseur, they weren't likely to become connoisseur of abstract art right away. Chances are they would have read the image as poking fun at abstract expressionist art because it was not ex easily understood by the average viewer and therefore not something of value. The rise of abstract art brought about the rise of critics and commentators who interpreted art for the average viewer. Rockwell stated that he wanted to make art that did not require intermediaries to interpret it for the public. Abstract art, in particular, was seen by the public and by critics as something that only appealed to, or could be understood by, the elite. As far back as 1939, critics such as Clement Greenberg labeled Rockwell's art as kitsch because it was immediately understandable by the average person and because it focused on simple and often humorous situations. For Greenberg, kitsch was the inevitable and undesirable result of the increasing urbanization and industrialization of American life. At that time, kitsch was also associated with the propagandistic art that was produced by authoritarian governments in Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and later in Soviet Russia. The freedom associated with abstract expressionist art was seen as the antidote to the socialist realism prescribed by the totalitarian government of Russia. Despite the public's hostility to modern art, Cold War paranoia prompted the CIA to secretly fund international tours by American jazz musicians and touring exhibitions of American avant-garde art as a way of both solidifying New York City's place as the center of modern art and of disproving the Soviet's accusation that America was a cultural wasteland. So knowing this, did Rockwell create the connoisseur as a satire, a critique of abstract expressionist art? It is possible to read Rockwell's careful imitation of a Pollock drip painting as an indication that he agreed with people who felt that abstract art was something that artists created when they were not capable of producing work in a realistic style. So by creating a fake Pollock, was Rockwell saying, look, I can do it all, realism and abstraction? It really is ambiguous. We can't see the man's face, and there is nothing in his demeanor to suggest an emotional response one way or the other. On the other hand, Rockwell said in a 1962 interview that if he were young and starting out again, he would try to be an abstract artist. The secret to Rockwell's success was his ability to bridge the gap between high and low art. 
His technique combined the lighting of Rembrandt and the character studies of Vermeer with the faces and situations of his life in small-town America. In The Connoisseur, he combines a beautifully rendered figure straight out of a, straight out of a menswear advertisement with a shout-out to one of the heroes of abstract expressionism. And in the end, his image is open to our interpretation. Rockwell kept his judgment to himself. <laughs>